chapter 1. If you notice in the bulletin, uh, the title of my message today is Hold Fast. Hold Fast. Uh, we're going to get down to that uh, in just a little bit, and you'll see where that comes from in Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, as we get ready to get in there. Hold fast, it says down in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Hold fast the faithful word. All right. Let's um, go ahead and I'm going to read verses 1 through 14, and then we will open in prayer this morning. All right. Chapter 1, verse 1, Titus 1. You ready? Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through the preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior." To Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come to you this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, do a work in our lives today. Lord, I pray that we would see that your word uh, is sure that your word is eternal, that your word is reliable, and your word does not return void uh, unto you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see that it is the standard by which we are to live our lives. And Lord, we help us to see that your word will change lives. Lord, I pray that you would just do work in our midst today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, as we get going here in Titus in chapter 1, um, the theme of this is going to be that uh, we need to stay by the Word of God. The Word of God is our standard. The Word of God is what we are to live our lives by. The Word of God is what we are to govern our churches by and to run our churches by, if you want to say it that way. And I was just thinking yesterday, I was driving somewhere, and I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but I was, I was on the road and I I got to thinking about uh, all of the objections that people have to God himself and all the questions that people have and and all of the issues that come up and and I got to thinking about that the word of God is the answer to all of those things we have the answer to all of life's conundrums and all of life's problems and all of life's mysteries in the Word of God. It is the answer to everything, and it is unchanging and unbending throughout all of time. As, as we see through the, through the ages how um, cultures have changed, and politics has changed, and, and countries have changed, and customs, and, and even in our own lifetimes, we can see how much uh, things have changed. It's, it's unbelievable to a child of the 60s, that kind of sounds weird, but I was born in 1969, so I'm not really a child of the 60s, like I grew up in the 60s or anything, but I was born in the 60s. For someone like me to think that you can have your whole Bible 
on your phone. I mean, you, when I was a kid in high school, a car phone was really cool. It was this thing that was in a car, right? And you answered calls on it. That was it. I mean, right? you didn't do anything else on your phone but that. Uh, but today you can have anything on your phone, right? And, and, and so much of our life has changed because of that. Uh, so much of our life has changed because of technology and, and what is available to us today. It's just, it's just unbelievable what's available to us today. But the Word of God has not changed. God has not changed changed. And when it comes to the to God and when it comes to the word of God, we don't have to get with the times. Okay? We don't have to do that because um, God's word does not change. I was reading an article this morning uh, about Beth Moore. Is it Beth Moore? Anybody know who Beth Moore is? Okay. Uh, and it tells in there that Beth Moore has left the Southern Baptist Convention. OK, uh, now that doesn't affect us here at all. OK, but it was interesting to me. So I started to read the article because I was thinking, well, why did she leave the Southern Baptist Convention? And <coughs> because if I had been in the Southern Baptist Convention, I would have left, too. But I was wondering why she left. And so I got to reading in there and it, and it gave some reasons, uh, some different things that um, that she had that she had uh, uh, done and said and her reasonings and all of that. Um, but uh, what was interesting to me, I found this other article and it was um, John MacArthur talking about Beth Moore and the Southern Baptist Convention. So it kind of it's kind of like a lot of my study does. It kind of goes gets off on this rabbit trail and and wanders around and everything. And and he was just simply saying, you know, um, and he was, uh, what should I say, criticizing the Southern Baptist Convention because they had let Beth Moore preach in church services, right? And it's clear in the Word of God that uh, if we were to go over to chapter 3 in, in the book of Titus where we are here, all right, um, it says, let me go down here. Is it first chapter three? Well, let me see. Now I'm, huh? Should be chapter three, right? Let me. If I gotta find it. Help, somebody help me. The 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 requirements of a bishop. No, it's in chapter two. No. I know it's in Timothy, but it's in Titus as well. It does say, oh, we'll just, we'll just use chapter 1. It already, I already read it. That's what I'm actually looking for. But it, it says here in verse 6, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife. Right? Bingo. Right? You have to be the husband of one wife in order to be a bishop, in order to be an elder in the church. And, and, and uh, many other teachings in Scripture tell us um, the, that uh, who is to be the preacher and who is not to be the preacher and all that. And the Southern Baptist Convention has allowed that to, to change over the years. Why? Because of... Because of um, public pressure, we could say it that way, because of the changing of the times and was, oh, well, women's, women's roles have changed and every, this is way more acceptable than it's ever been and, and all that. Wait a minute. I know that culture has changed. I know that all of these things are, have changed, but the Word of God has not changed, right? And, and, and I've told you this before. That's one of my criticisms of all of the new versions that are out there. It's just like a new version. All the, I read uh, a, while a while back the rate at which a new version of the Bible comes out. And, you know, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the textual reasons or, or whatever, or what I, what I find wrong with, the, with all of them, but it, it's sends a message that God's Word is constantly changing. God's Word is not constantly changing. God's Word has not changed. It has never changed. The Bible says that it is forever settled in heaven. It's done. It's over. And, and the only thing that are changing are people's views on the Word of God. And we're constantly trying to find uh, different ways to understand it and new meaning and, and different ways to um, um, to justify 
what we want to do and justify maybe even what we're already doing. Okay, God's word does not change. God's word is like uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 and 29 says, Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? The word of God is the hammer. The word of God is the, that which changes other things. It's not changed. All right. And so we as people, as students of the word of God, we need to look to the word of God and we need to change according to the word of God, not try to change the word of God. Do you understand that? Hold fast the faithful word. Paul is, is, is instructing young Titus here and he's left Titus there in Crete and he's given him a job. He's given him a purpose and he's told him what he is to do. Okay. He said for this cause, verse five, left I thee in Crete that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Paul had left Titus there in Crete. Paul had traveled to Crete and Paul had had uh, taken Titus with him, and then he left him there for what? To set things in order, right? To set things in order. What was he doing? Um, uh, Titus was, was to be there to establish churches throughout the island of Crete. And he was to get the church going. He was to establish churches, and he was to set elders over every church. Now, as we read this, I want to point out one thing. Notice in verse 5, it says, ordain elders in every city. And then look down at verse 7. It says, for a bishop must be blameless. And it gives the requirements of a bishop. Now, what is Paul talking about here? What Paul's talking about here is the person that we know as the pastor. The elder of the church, the bishop of the church, is the pastor. He is the one. He's using those two words to, to, to describe the same person. Okay? The elder, the bishop, is to be, and then it gives the, the requirements there, blameless, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, no, not given to filthy lucre but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and temperate. And so he's describing the person. He just, he's describing what they are, and then he tells us what they're supposed to do. Holding fast the faithful word. So look, get, the, get the picture here with me. Paul is telling Titus, I want you to, to put things in order. I want you to establish things. I want you to tell them how things ought to be done. Set elders slash bishops slash pastors over each and every one of these congregations that gets, that gets settled there. And then I want you to teach them to hold fast to the word of God. This is what they're supposed to do. This is what they're supposed to, uh, and, and how they're supposed to do it. Okay, hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, that he may be able by sound doctrine, that sound teaching, both to exhort and to convince the gainsay the gainsayers. Okay, um, and he's to do that by the word of God. The word of God does not change. In our text, Paul is writing to, to young Titus, who was on the Isle of Crete. Now, after Paul was released from prison in Rome, he and Titus traveled together for a while. They stopped in Crete, and when it was time for Paul to go, he left Titus behind to help the churches there. Now, I, don't, I want you to, to, to think about this. Um, Crete is not some backwater place in, in, in the middle of nowhere, no, no uh, insignificant place. Titus was not exiled there. 
Okay, at this time, Crete was an important industrial center. Uh, I, I looked on, on the internet, on Wikipedia, it says that Crete forms a significant part of the economy and cultural heritage of Greece. It was once the center of the Minoan civiliz civilization in uh, BC 2700 to 1420, which is currently regarded as the earliest recorded civilization in Europe. Now, why do I mention that? I mention that because it is inherent in civilized places, in places who believe that they are like the epicenter of the world, to believe that they are smarter than everybody else out there. And to believe that they're more advanced than other people. And to believe that they are, that they kind of have it all figured out. Does it sound like anybody you know? Any culture that you know? Does it sound like the United States of America to you? You know, too many times we feel like we've got it all figured out. And we're too smart or we're too advanced or we're too civilized or we're too, too uh, whatever to rely on or to trust in the Bible, in a Savior. And, to, and, 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 and it's, it's like us to think, well, that Bible needs to catch up with the times a little bit. Okay? And my point here is, is that Paul left Titus in a culture that I believe was very similar in many ways to the culture that we live in today. The Bible is relevant in every age uh, known to man because the Bible does not change. And you know, the reality is, is that man does not change. We are the same as we were back when Titus was left in Crete. We still have the same problems. We still have the same arrogance. We still have the same, we've, we've, we've arrived kind of an attitude. Okay. So this is no small assignment for Titus. Titus is there. This may be his first, his first assignment all on his own. It may be the first time that he's ever had to, he's ever had to, to do this, and now he's been left there. Okay, Titus' first duty was to ordain elders in every city. Okay, uh, I already, already explained to that. That elder slash deacon or um, slash bishop is the same, is the same person. Okay. Um, Within these qualifications, we come to verse 9, which says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Now, we're switching here, as I mentioned, from the character of the person, who the person is, to his practice, what he is supposed to do. And then we continue with the basic theme of practice for the rest of the letter. What is he supposed to do? How is he supposed to do it? And, 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 and moving on. Now, the nail that, that all of this hangs on is right there in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word, right? Titus, this is your job. Titus, this is your assignment. Titus, this is what you're supposed to do. No matter what goes on, no matter what happens, go back to the Word of God, and that is your anchor, and that is your, that is your, <clears throat> your, your rock that you, can, that you can stand on. Hold fast. Hold fast. Now, do you think that Paul knew that it was going to be hard? Absolutely. Paul knew this was going to be terrible. We read down further on, uh, even in this verse, and it says here in verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, one of their own people, one of their own citizen said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. You know, one of the common threads that I've seen every place that I have ever been and tried to establish a work or help establish a work or whatever the case may be, is that people, someone will inevitably tell me, oh, the people here are hard. You just don't understand it. You've never been any place like this. The people are harder here than anywhere else. And this, I think, is what this, this, this person is saying. The Cretans, oh, you don't know the Cretans, right? They're always liars, right? They're evil beasts. They're slow bellies, right? And Paul says he's right, right? His witness is true. Uh, this is going to be a hard assignment, Titus, but hold fast. Hold fast the word. Stick to the word of God. It was brought up in Sunday school uh, this morning that 
that um, uh, a, a lot of times when you're speaking to somebody uh, of, of another faith, let's say, and they have their books that they go by. And, and you could apply this to the Catholics. You could apply this to the Mormons. You could apply this to lots of other um, faiths, we'll call them. Okay. Um, call, you, you, you could say that about secular humanism, Right. We have our books, we have our science, we have our blah, 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 whatever. Whenever you're dealing with someone like that, you have to bring them back to the Word of God. Don't get caught up in trying to reason with them. Don't get caught up in trying to convince them. Don't get caught up in trying to, uh, you know, outfox them or prove this or that. Take them to the Word of God. Take them back to the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't change. The Word of God does not return unto Him void. And the Word of God has the additional power of the Holy Spirit working for it and in it and through it. Go back to the Word, Titus. Hold fast the Word of faith. The faithful Word, as it were. Okay? Holding fast the faithful Word. What did Paul mean by this? Okay? <coughs> There in chapter, or in, in, in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word. What does that mean? That word that's translated word there is the word logos. And it's not just talking about the word on a page necessarily, right? It's talking about the spoken word. It's talking about the word of God. Now put that together. Think about that. The spoken word of God. This is what God says. This is not just any old book. This is not just some random collection of, of letters written by people over 2,000 years ago. This is, this is not just a normal book. This is the very spoken word of God. The word of God is, is, <clears throat> was inspired by God. Okay, he spoke it through these men and placed it on this page. He meant, Titus, you are bound by the word. There is no room for preferences. There is no room for opinion. There is no room for debate. Titus, hold fast. This is what God said. Parents, have you ever, <coughs> have you ever told your, your kids, or maybe you called home, maybe you went away and your kids are at home and you call back to check on things and just, and just uh, see how everything is going. And you, 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 the, the phone call comes in and it's answered and you hear one of your kids say hello. And in the background, you hear just all kinds of noise and confusion and fighting and rah, you know, the whole thing going on. Have you ever heard that? And, and, and what do you say? Tell your brothers and sisters that dad said right it was like it's going to put an extra punch to it right and I'm going to really convince them this is not just a suggestion dad said knock it off or when I get home dad will take care of it right and to the well-raised child they know what that means that means dad is going to take care of it OK, and 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 it has it has authority because dad said the word of God has authority because God said this is the very word of God. This is what God said in the if you've ever studied the the acrostic Baptist, we like to do that sometimes because it it, it, it isn't totally envelop all that Baptists believe, but it, it, it really tells what Baptist, what sets Baptists apart from, from maybe other, uh, from other beliefs. And that is the Baptist acrostic. And the B, the big B in Baptist means the Bible. The Bible is the only rule in faith and practice. We don't have another book. We don't have a, 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 a big constitution or, a, or whatever you want to call it amongst all the Baptists that this is the rules of being a Baptist and this is what you have to. No, all it says is this is what we go by. Amen. This is what governs us. This is what teaches us. This is what we live by. This is what we rule by. This is what we go by. And f that's, that's one of the reasons in our back in um, when did we do that? I think we did it in 2015. We redid our constitution here and we tried to go back to laying more uh, emphasis on the Bible says, right? 
not here's a whole bunch of rules that we're going to do, but stripping some of them away and saying, <clears throat> this is what we rule by. OK, and, and there's so much emphasis and there's so much thought uh, these days about trying to protect churches from this and protect churches from that and and all of this kind of stuff. And it says, you know what? Just go back to the word of God. That's our rule. That's what we go by. Hold fast, Titus, the word of God. Titus, hold fast and Titus, find men who will hold fast. That's the, that's the example that we give. That's the, 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 uh, the mandate that preachers and pastors have been given. Hold fast the faithful word. You see, Paul knew the opposite, that opposition would come. Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and, and 2 Timothy chapter 3 uh, uh, about all kinds of things. Because he, he knew the opposition that was coming. He knew what was going on, what was, what was going to happen. It was sound doctrine that would be able to stand against all of these things. And here it says in verse 9 that they may be able to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Right? Now, we live in a day that discounts doctrine. You see, the, people would say that doctrine divides. Okay? Uh, we, don't want to, we don't want doctrine in our churches. We don't want this. We want to, to allow everybody to come in and everybody to feel comfortable and everybody to, to just, uh, <coughs> just to be accepted. Now, everyone is, com is accepted here. Everyone is welcome here. Right? But... Everyone needs to recognize when they come here that we are going to teach doctrine. We're going to teach what this book says. And, 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 and in that, we will find true, uh, true unity and true uh, ability to, to work and to, to serve. Okay? It was sound doctrine that would be able to stand against them. And only sound doctrine. Okay? Churches all over this country are minimizing doctrine, minimizing teaching. Okay. Many things have, have replaced that. Music has replaced the message. A Disneyland mentality has replaced doctrine. Okay. Paul said, stick with the word. Stick with doctrine. Okay. So what was Titus to do with this sound doctrine? First of all, he was to exhort. Okay. That word exhort means to strongly encourage or urge to do something. That means exhorting was through sound doctrine. Titus 2 and verse 1 says, But speak thou the things which befit sound doctrine. Okay? It was to be the word, not opinion, not tradition, that led them. Okay? That word exhort. Maybe it was by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the, gain, the gainsayers. You see, the pastor is to be a teacher, right? The pastor is to teach sound doctrine. But then the pastor is to exhort according to that teaching to convince the gainsayers, to try to convince them who oppose them. Who oppose what? Who oppose sound doctrine, who oppose the teaching, who oppose whatever it is that, that is being taught. That is, that is the job that we've, we've been given. All through the rest of Titus, we find specific instructions that Paul gave uh, to, to, to Titus. We find instructions for older Christians, for older men, and for older women. Um, we see in chapter 2, and verses 6 and 9, young men and and servants and all kinds of things. Titus 2.15 says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. No man, just let no man despise you. What is, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, because you have the word of God, because you have the very spoken word of God, you can with all authority stand in your pulpit and exhort those who don't believe the way you do and exhort those who disagree with you and exhort those who would stand against you. Paul says, a rebuke and exhort with all authority. Authority. This is all the authority that I need to stand up here and preach to you today and say, this is what the Word of God said. And as long as I stay within the bounds of Scripture, 
I can with all authority tell you that. Now, I could stand up here and tell you that all men ought to have their hair cut the way I have it. Okay? Right? And, and I could be convinced of that. And I could, that could be my honest opinion. And I could make all kinds of wonderful cases for why we ought to have our, our hair cut this way. But I have zero authority to do that. Right? I have no authority. I may have a good opinion. I might have good reasons. I might have all kinds of things. Right? But when I preach the Word of God, I have all authority. All authority. Right? Chapter 3 is full of various exhortations. We can look over there. Uh, let's look over at chapter 3 and verse 9. Chapter 3 and verse 9 says here, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies, contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Okay? Um, what is Paul saying? He's saying stick to sound doctrine. Don't get all caught up in all the baloney that goes on all over the internet or, or wherever you're reading about it. Don't get caught up in the strivings about the law and foolish questions and genealogies and contentions. If you go out and, and, and you speak to people <clears throat> out on the street or in their homes or, or at the corral or wherever you're talking to them, and you know, you get all kinds of questions and complaints and, 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 and different things. Well, I just couldn't, you know, I, I, I went to church once and I got, you know, and then just and all kinds of things. You know what? Don't get involved with that. Don't get involved with it. Don't get involved with, with all of that um, strivings about the law and foolish questions and genealogy and contentions. Don't worry about that. Hold fast the faithful word as you've been taught. Just stick to the word of God. You can't go wrong there. You have all authority there as long as you're in the word of God. All right? The second was a little bit more confrontational, okay? It says convincing the, na the gainsayers. The word convince is also translated as rebuke and reprove, okay? Look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 15. Just should be there just across the page from you. It says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. That is the same word as convince. Rebuke and convince is the same Greek word. All right? So, what is Paul saying? Rebuke the gainsayers. Convince the gainsayers. All right? <coughs> Take them on. Uh, gainsayers are those who contradict us or who stand against us. Uh, and, and another definition of that is decline to obey. All right. Now, who are the gainsayers? Who is he talking about here? Well, I think that the world around us, okay, are typically gainsayers. There are those who are against the Word of God. There are those who are against God. There are those who deny God. There, there's all kinds of categories of gainsayers, though, okay? Uh, those who contradict or stand against us. There are also, I believe, churches that no longer stand. We could call them gainsayers. I think we could also put into that category Christians who do not obey the Word of God. Remember I said one of the definitions is to decline to obey. There are those who even might call themselves Christians but do not obey the Word of God. They're gainsayers as well. All right? Now, what does it look like for, 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 for us to obey? Okay, what does it look like? It means that I must change what I think to what God thinks. That's obey. If it's in the Word of God, then I need to obey it. Okay, so the idea is that we are to reprove or rebuke those who stand against us. Okay, but we're not only to simply reprove them, we're not simply to exhort them. It is sound doctrine that will do that. It's not my efforts that are going to do that. It's through the Word of God that we try to get them uh, convinced or to change. Okay? Now, years ago, I made a commitment that whatever I currently believe, okay, whatever that is, if in the light of Scripture, if 
God reveals something to me in Scripture, or if someone challenges me with the Scriptures and shows me that I am wrong about something, there's a, there's a possibility that I might be wrong about the way I cut my hair. Right. There's a possibility. And if somebody can show that to me out of Scripture, then I am bound to change. Right. Whatever it is that I hold uh, in, in my beliefs, whatever it is that I that I hang on to, if if somehow through Scripture, someone or the Holy Spirit convinces me that that I am not walking in obedience to the Scripture, I am bound. I am obligated to to change right I'm obligated to do that and that that is my my commitment uh, that I've made to myself and that is something that I try to do if God shows me something in his word and I'm doing something contrary to that I must change right absolutely absolutely uh, isn't that what Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, it says, if any, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, if you're holding on to anything, anything that you won't give up, you're not worthy to be my son. You're holding on to some belief. You're holding on to some practice. And you're holding on to, to some culture or to some whatever it may be. And you say, oh, I would come to Christ, but I can't give this up. Oh, I would, I would obey the scriptures, but I'm not going to start doing that. I would do, if, if that's where you're at, then, then Christ said, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Right? I must change. Okay? I must change. That's the bottom line. All right? Is this not what we're asking the lost to do? Right? We ask the lost to do that all the time when we show them that, we're, that they're sinners and that they must repent and turn to Christ. And they say, well, I've been a, I've been a member of this church my whole life. I could... No, you have to leave that. You have to turn to Christ. But I've been, I've, been, I've been a Catholic, I've been a Lutheran, I've been a Mormon, I've been a Jehovah's Witness, I've been a Baptist my whole life. You say, none of that will get you to heaven. You have to turn and trust Christ. We're asking them to leave everything behind and turn to Christ. And as a Christian... We still get things in our lives that we hang on to, whether that be sin or whether that be some practice or some, some appetite that we indulge or whatever the case may be. We hang on to some of these things so hard sometimes and say, no, I just won't leave that. I won't stop that. I won't, I won't change that. But we ask the lost to do that all the time. Think, oh, they ought to, loot. They ought to leave that. They ought to change that aspect of their life. Right? Don't lose sight of that fact. We must repent as well. Is this not what we're asking the gainsayers to do? Is this not what Paul is instructing Timothy, or Titus to tell the gainsayers to do? Okay. Uh, you know, many of us, and I'm going to step on your toes and my toes this morning. Many of us have settled into a comfortable Christianity that we can just live with. And it's not really pure obedience to the Word of God. It's not pure selling out to the cause of Christ. It's not really being what Christ wants us to be. But we've kind of settled into this comfort zone. And we say, well, you know, I, I know I'm not quite doing everything maybe I ought to do. But, but I still feel like I'm better than everybody else and, I, I, as far as sin and all of those things. So, and I'm just kind of comfortable here. And I have my, these friends and I have these friends. And, 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 and everything's just kind of going, going along. But, but none of us... Are, are really willing to step out and just be 100% on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. 100% obedient to God's words. Ah, oh, God will forgive me if I don't do that. Right? Is that really the point? Yeah, God will forgive me. I'm going to get away. I'm going to, I'm going to just continue on in my sin because I know God will forgive me. I'm just going to continue on in my mediocrity because God is going to forgive me of that. Is that really, 
really what Luke 14 is talking about? Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Does that sound like mediocre Christianity to you? Christ is not calling us to mediocre Christianity. Christ is calling us to be disciples, to leave everything behind, and to follow Him. Exhort them, convince them. And Titus, there are many. There are many. Look at verses 10 through 14. It says there, well, let's just look at verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Right? I really believe that Paul is talking here about all kinds of opposition, even within the churches there in Crete. Not, not just the lost outside, but even those who might come and claim to, to, to believe in God and to be followers of God. It talks there about they of the circumcision. It's talking about the Jews there, right? And, and many of them came to Christ, but just couldn't quite let go of their Judaism. There are many, many adversaries. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9 says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Many adversaries. The adversaries of Christ are many. The adversaries of the gospel are many. The adversaries of the truth are many. The adversaries of the faithful word are many. Do you realize there are many Christians that say, you know, you just need to lighten up a little bit. Don't take all this so serious. There are many adversaries. Titus, hold fast. Hold fast. You know, it is amazing to me how relentless Satan is. Now, we've, we've, we've talked about many things that Satan is and how Satan wants to destroy us and Satan wants to lead us astray. And Satan wants us to be mediocre. And he is relentless, relentless, relentless. He just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. I was talking to a man from over uh, in the valley, uh, over between Hardin and, and St. X last week. And uh, he happens to be a Mennonite. And he was telling me that when he first came into the valley over there, he is very strong about not working on Sunday. Very strong, right? And he said it was amazing. He was brand new over there. He said it was amazing how relentless the pressure was to give, a, give that up. Relentless. This is the way Satan is. He, constant. Constant. Have you ever noticed that the wickedness around us just seems to keep coming and coming, and we might push it back for a little bit, and it just keeps coming and coming and coming, and we think, oh, we, 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 we got that pushed back, and next thing you know, it's overrun the wall, and, and, it's, and it's coming again, Right? It's relentless. Hold fast, Titus, for there are many who would have you back down. There are many, Titus, who would have you give up. There are many, Titus, who would want you to leave your stand. There are many who would have you compromise. There are many who would have you soften or avoid or even forsake the faithful word. And you know what? Many times those will be Christians. Many times. Titus, you must hold fast. You must find faithful men who will hold fast the faithful word. Ours is not a time to back down. Ours is not a time to give up. Ours is a time to hold fast the faithful word. We need a renewed commitment as believers to the word of God. A new commitment. Do you read it? Do you meditate on it? Do you obey it? Are you going to take it as mere literature, as some do? 
that you can pass judgment on and pick it apart as you see fit. You know, as I'm, I'm studying for Wednesday night through the book of Daniel, many of the commentaries that you read about that are going to tell you about all the things that the critics say about the book of Daniel or all the things that the critics say about whatever book it is that you're reading. There are a plethora of critics out there constantly cutting down the Word of God. You know, there, there comes a time in your life where you just need to say, you know what? The, the, the Bible has never, ever, ever been proven in error. The Bible has never been proven wrong or, 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 or anything. And so there comes a time where you just need to settle it in your mind and say, I believe the Word of God. And I'm going to obey the Word of God. Are you going to take it as it is, inspired, authoritative, powerful? It is God's d message directly from His lips to your heart. Read it, obey it, preach it, live it. Hold fast the faithful word. You see, the word of God does not change, but the word of God will change you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, and Lord, as we look to you, and Lord, as we look to your word, and we see the challenge that you've given us today, Lord, I pray that your, your hand would be upon us, that you would help us to hold fast the faithful word. Lord, there are so many temptations. There is so much pressure to back off. Constant, constant pressure to back off. Lord, I pray that you'd help us that we not be a people that back off, that we not be a people that let down on the faithful word. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to continue to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And Lord, I pray that we might be convinced ourselves and that we not be gainsayers. Lord, I thank you so much for all that you've done for us. I pray that you'd guide and direct. And Lord, I ask that you would just use us, use me, for your honor and glory, dear Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.